You wouldn't have thought you could go wrong selling an SUV of almost any kind these days, but Ford has struggled to shift its largest one, this Edge model. The brand launched it in 2016, updated it two years later to create this revised version, and then announced in mid-2019 that it would be discontinuing Edge sales at the end of the year. So here, we're gonna take a last look at this car and decide whether the final changes made make it worthy of your attention. The reasons for this Edge model's demise aren't particularly difficult to discern. This Canadian-built SUV is very much a US market-style product, and it's too heavy and bulky to offer the agility of European and Asian rivals, yet it's priced higher than most of them. Plus, despite this Ford's prodigious size, Western Hemisphere buyers can't have it with the kind of seven-seat versatility that volume-branded SUVs tend to need in this segment of the market. Nevertheless, there are things about this Edge that you might still rather like. It has a huge boot, plenty of rear seat space, and generous levels of equipment. Plus, as we'll find out in this film, the improvements made to this revised version were considerable. Its updates included a new EcoBlue spec version of the brand's 2-litre diesel engine and a power hike for that unit in its fastest form to 238 PS, with that top power plant mated to a more sophisticated version of Ford's intelligent all-wheel drive system. And the changes made in 2018 also included the addition of a new 8-speed automatic gearbox, plus this car included a stack of useful camera-driven safety kit thanks to the brand's Copilot 360 driver assistance technology pack. Package. Add in extra media connectivity, courtesy of the Blue Oval's clever Ford Pass Connect embedded modem, and the Sync 3 communications and entertainment system, and you can see why this Edge might still have a fair degree of showroom appeal. Which, of course, last of the line models like this one will need to justify premium pricing that pitches them against a very strong set of segment rivals. Can a case for the Edge still be made? Well, let's put this car to the test. Ford has earned an enviable reputation over the past two decades for the way its cars ride and handle, but in recent times there's been a slight switch of emphasis that more greatly prioritises comfort. Now you could argue about whether that's appropriate on large blue oval brand models like the Mondeo or the S-Max, which originally built their reputations on the back of uh, dynamic standard of drive. What's not up for debate though is that a comfort-orientated approach is entirely in keeping with the remit of a large SUV like this edge. Now contrary to what the magazines might tell you, no one's going to be buying this car and then wondering why it doesn't respond particularly well to being thrown around the lanes. A number of things have changed mechanically with this revised model, primarily the fact that the four-cylinder, two-litre diesel unit that all European Edge models have to have has been upgraded to cleaner, modern-era EcoBlue status. In its entry-level state of tune, you get 150 PS, 30 PS less than before, and you have to have front-wheel drive. Previously, the car was only offered in 4x4 form. That's not the only reason that 90% of Edge buyers ignore the base variant. They also reason correctly that 150 PS isn't a lot of grunt to propel along over two tons of Canadian built automotive real estate. The quoted rest of 62 miles an hour sprint time is 11.2 seconds on the way to 115 miles an hour, but it'll feel slower and more lethargic than that as the car slurs through the ratios of the eight speed auto gearbox, which replaces the previous six speeder across the range. That's another model update feature. So if you are one of that rarest of things, uh, an edge buyer, then you'll be almost certainly opting for the uprated version of the 2-litre diesel, uh, which we're trying here. It's a twin-turbo unit putting out a much more satisfying 238 PS. That's 28 PS more than the previous flagship engine could generate. And 500 Nm of torque, that's 50 Nm more. This improves the performance stats to 9.6 seconds and 134 miles an hour. And this engine has to be had with the upgraded version of Ford's intelligent all-wheel drive system. Now on this revised model, uh, this setup can completely decouple the rear axle when extra traction isn't required, so saving fuel. And when you do need extra grip, it engages the rear axle more quickly so that torque from this front base setup is more rapidly shunted rearwards. To quote one Ford engineer, uh, there's no longer a step function. 
Now we'll get to off-roading in a minute, but we should start with a focus on the tarmac drive dynamics that will be of infinitely greater importance to likely owners. Now, as you'll have gathered from our comments at the beginning, uh, the way that this edge lurches about makes it a very different kind of SUV from Ford's Cougar, the next model down in the company's SUV lineup. Uh, there are so many reasons why. The prodigious curb weight is obviously a factor, so is the vague steering feedback and the near 2.2 meter width with mirrors out, which can make the edge feel a bit of a handful on narrower country lanes. And the hesitant response from the auto gearbox isn't especially helpful either, although you can improve it slightly by pressing the central sport button that's provided on the awkward little rotary selector. That's about the closest you get to a drive setting on this car, Unlike virtually all its rivals, unlike a Focus for goodness sake, the Edge doesn't have a driving mode system to alter steering, feel and throttle response. Ford has hoped to compensate by building in stop and go and lane centering assist functionality into the optional adaptive cruise control system and there is an intelligent speed limiter that can read road signs and control your speed appropriately. That gives you a bit of extra peace of mind throughout the kind of urban motoring in which, at the wheel of a titanium or Vignale trimmed edge variant, you might notice that the low speed ride quality is actually quite good. Uh, the thing is though that you probably won't be in one of those derivatives. Over 80% of edge buyers choose the mid-range ST line model, which has to be had with a stiffened sport suspension setup, which crashes much more noticeably over tarmac tears, potholes and speed humps. Of course, this damping setup uh, gives you a bit more body control at speed when cornering, but in this Vignale spec test car, we've not found that to be a particular issue once you adjust to the considerable weight transference, which will start to become apparent if you're unwise enough to start trying to throw this thing about. There's plenty of grip and mid-corner bumps do very little to shake this edge's composure, even when you're powering on. On the ST line model, Ford offers an optional active front steering system, which is supposed to make the edge feel more stable when you're cornering at higher speeds. Uh, we wouldn't bother if this really isn't that kind of car. It's better to focus on the things that this SUV is better at. Um, it'd be a great tow car, a trailer capacity is rated at 2.2 tonnes across the range, although we don't understand why that's so much less than US market edge models, which can apparently lug along up to 3.5 tonnes. But this Ford can be much more than just a load lugger. Ride quality at higher speeds smooths out noticeably. Uh, this really would be an excellent long distance traveling companion. And that's something that's aided by this car's really superb standards of Refinement. One magazine recorded an interior noise figure at 70 miles an hour that was on a par with the Bentley Bentayga. Now, standard acoustic side glass helps here, and so does the clever active noise cancellation system that we first saw on the Mondeo Vignale. Here, three microphones inside the cabin detect engine noise levels and then transmit a nullifying counter frequency through the stereo speakers. Uh, the benefits of this aren't felt as keenly around town as the engine spools up and down at low speeds. Uh, the diesel rumble abates enough for you to hear the little turbos spinning and cooing away like little mating spring birds as you pilot this big Ford around another environment in which its size stands out. It's certainly not quite as easy to park or thread through heavy traffic as a comparably priced but smaller mid-sized RAV4 or CRV class SUV would be. Tight spots that you simply cruise through in a Cougar need careful attention in an edge. And off the beaten track, well, as you might expect, the Edge is no Land Rover Discovery, but by the more modest mud-plugging standards of other SUVs in this class, it equips itself uh, very well. Uh, a reasonable level of ground clearance, just over 200 mils, uh, certainly helps, as does the wheel angle flexibility of the all-independent suspension setup. Uh, the damping system is, we should mention, a purely passive package. There's no selective adaptive option of the kind you'd find in German rivals. More significant on an SUV though is the lack of a height adjustable air suspension option or self-leveling rear suspension to make towing easier. Still there are plenty of other SUVs at or near this price point that lack those features too. 
This big Ford's intelligent all-wheel drive system is a permanent setup and like nearly all its rivals uses torque on demand technology to send power to whichever wheel has the most traction. Uh, the software gauges that via 25 sensors and monitors how much grip the car has every 60 milliseconds so the driver can remain blissfully unaware as to which axle or which individual wheel is doing most of the work unless he or she chooses to monitor the process from a selectable display provided on the instrument cluster. As a result of this, muddy car parks and field tracks are well within the edge's remit. Uh, you might have to leave the Serengeti though to run off fines. Exterior design, according to Ford, is the biggest determining factor towards purchase of an SUV, which perhaps explains why the original version of this car struggled so much in our market after its launch in 2016. One senior blue oval designer described its looks as heavy-handed, though it's certainly more appropriate to the other side of the Atlantic. Hence the aesthetic updates made to this car in 2018 that changed much but ultimately delivered little. The bonnet, the tailgate, the bumpers and the front grille were all restyled, but the bulky end result looked little different with its sculpted bodywork and its sharply raked C-pillars. If you were to notice this as an updated model, it would probably be because of the wider grille, which is the main differentiator between the three trim levels. Now it's conventionally chrome framed on the base titanium variant. It has a completely black finish on the mid-range ST line derivative, and it's set apart with a hexagonal mesh design in this top Vignale version. Uh, the high set headlamps that flank this opening were separated uh, and upgraded to full LED status across the range as part of the facelift package of changes and on this Vignale model they gain standard matrix adaptive lighting technology too and that makes them reactive to road conditions and other traffic. Lower down heavily emphasized LED front fog lamp recesses sit on the outer edges of a chunky bumper which incorporates a lower skid plate style section which is silver finished on the ST line model to underline this model's SUV status. From the side here, you get more of a perspective for the sheer size of this Ford. Uh, the cars are substantial 2.2 meters in width with mirrors outstretched, and it's fully 4.8 meters long, making it actually slightly larger than a properly large segment SUV like Volkswagen's Touareg. It's certainly much bigger than the kind of comparable five-seater D segment SUV model you might think this Edge would be more likely to compete with. Uh, Toyota RAV4, for example, is around 4.6 meters long. The styling does do its best to disguise this bulk with sharp edged creases that are smart if a bit generic. Uh, a mid-level feature line flows through the door handles while another lower down gives the flank some shape. Uh, now depending on the model chosen, a handsome 19 or 20 inch alloys fill the chunky wheel arches and uh, wraparound door panels cover the recessed sills to prevent your legs from picking up dirt as you climb in. The rear looks neat too, although it is curious that Ford decided to ditch a full width lighting strip for this revised model at just the time that other manufacturers are adopting that feature. At the top of this uh, steeply raked tailgate is a spoiler and uh, there's a handle on the lower section which is easy to find in the dark. Further down there's another skid plate style panel below the bumper. This separates uh, twin exhaust pipes on either side. Of course, what's more important is the stuff that you can't see. Now under the skin, the Edge sits on the same CD4 platform that Ford uses for the other large models in its passenger car range, uh, the Mondeo and the S-Max and Galaxy MPVs. Time to take a look inside. Now there's a well-chosen semi-high-rise hit point that means you don't have to clamber up into the driver's seat in a way that's uh, necessary with some other large SUVs and with previous truck-based big Ford 4x4s. Get comfortable in the commanding driving position and then look around. Well, 
Not much has changed as part of the facelift package of updates. The only really key difference is the addition of this little circular controller for the transmission, which looks more modern than the previous gear stick, but which is more awkward to use. Now, if you've chosen a Vignale spec car like this one, the tuxedo style quilted seat trim will certainly be a talking point, particularly if, as in this test car, it's in practically cream colored, darker colored leather works better. Otherwise, there'll be plenty that'll be familiar if you're used to driving any of Ford's other larger cars. Now, you just mentioned earlier that the Edge sits on the same underpinnings as a Mondeo, an S-Max, or a Galaxy. And that's something that you could guess just by looking at the dashboard because it's pretty much exactly the same as you'd find in one of those models. Uh, to some extent, that's not a bad thing. The instrument panel and the center console feature a smoothly fashioned one-piece design, highlighted by chrome accents, which frame the uh, central and peripheral air vents. Ahead of you through the leather-trimmed multifunction three-spoke steering wheel, there's a classy, if rather cluttered, instrument cluster that gives you this 10-inch TFT screen setup. Ford calls this arrangement configurable, but because it's made up of various inset multifunction displays, it can't be properly customized to show the kind of full-width navigation mapping that you find in many rival brand setups. Still, there is a lot of information to view here if you can be bothered to go looking for it all. Uh, within the Left speedometer dial, you'll find selectable trip computer, fuel economy, and driver assist safety system options. In the middle, uh, you can select from entertainment, navigation, or phone options. And on the right, within the rev counter, there's a non-configurable display that shows the door open status, your driving range, traffic signs, and a fuel gauge. Anything the instrument binnacle can't tell you will probably be covered by the 8-inch SYNC 3 color touchscreen that dominates the center stack. Smoothly integrated into the dashboard rather than sitting proud of the fascia like an afterthought, as is the case with most opposition models. Now this is there to play its part in reducing button clutter, giving the cabin a cleaner, smarter feel, and it felt quite high tech back in 2016. A few years on though, the graphics and screen refresh times lack the sophistication of rival infotainment packages, and you might also object to paying this amount of money and then being given exactly the same infotainment monitor which is fitted to a Fiesta. Still, you can't fault the range of features the SYNC 3 package provides, improved on this revised model by the addition on plusher variants of the clever Ford Pass Connect embedded modem setup, which gives you onboard Wi-Fi and live traffic information. As for more conventional stuff, well, we're pleased to see that an old-fashioned CD player has been retained, and climate controls can be activated here if you don't want to use the uh, fiddly buttons further down the center stack. Uh, the other main screen options allow you to deal with audio settings, navigation, uh, various apps, and Bluetooth phone activation, plus, of course, there's Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring. Uh, voice activation allows you to issue simple one-shot commands, like play song, to play a song from a CD, Where Am I? to find out where you are, or even I'm Hungry to bring up a list of local restaurants from the system's built-in Michelin guide. Directions can then be activated from the split screen navigation display. Uh, not so good is the way that the touchscreen attracts fingerprints and reflections that you'll particularly notice if you've got the optional panoramic sunroof that we have fitted here. Features like that certainly make you feel spoiled, as does the superb 12-speaker, 1,000-watt B&O premium audio system that ST-Line and Vignale versions of this revised model get a standard, and that's accessible by a separate little sound button if you don't want to stab away at the touchscreen. Uh, next to that is a further switch for the optional front wide-view camera system that most Edge buyers tend to want. Leather upholstery is included as standard across the range, but even if you get it in its ritziest tuxedo trim, form, there still isn't quite the plush depth of quality that you'd find in a premium brand SUV at this price point. One writer described this cabin as having all the ambiance of a recently refurbished Hilton hotel. And while that is a touch unkind, we kind of understand what he was getting at. You might think that in this Vignale model, the extra leather on the dashboard and the doors helps, um, but, or you might feel as we do that it makes the cheaper materials stand out all the more. 
Still, at least this is a very practical place to be. Depth, a particular feature of the cup holders behind the gear selector and the storage box that sits further back between the seats. This lidded compartment includes an interim tray, an integrated coin holder and a 12 volt port. Uh, the lidded area in the middle of the center stack includes more connectivity, a couple of USB points. And further up, there's a shallow lidded storage area uh, on the fascia top. And Ford hasn't forgotten to include an overhead compartment for your sunglasses. The glove box isn't especially big and the door pockets are disappointingly tiny, but there is recessed storage space behind the center stack. There are ticket clips on the sun visors and you get a little narrow tray between each seat base and the front door scuff plates. What else? Well, this 10-way uh, adjustable powered seat is superbly comfortable and it includes four-way adjustable lumbar support. Plus, the steering wheel offers lots of movement for both height and reach, so it's easy to find a really comfortable driving position. It is just as well that these chairs position you commandingly because all-round visibility could be better. The windscreen pillars are chunky and huge rear pillars and a relatively small rear screen combine to limit your over-the-shoulder vision. So it's just as well well that all-round parking sensors and a rear view camera come as standard across the range. Right, time to take a seat in the back. Now as at the front, the doors open wide to make access easy. Once you're inside, you'll find massively more space than is provided by mid-sized SUV models at this price point. No other SUV priced remotely close to this one can comfortably seat three adults across the back seat, but such a feat is easily managed by this Ford, aided by a notably low-set centre transmission tunnel. Now, there's plenty of room for heads too, although the ceiling height will be slightly compromised if you pay extra for the panoramic glass roof. The seats don't slide back and forth, but they do uh, recline for greater comfort on longer journeys, and they're also heated on most variants. Plus, on plusher models, your ears will be caressed by the prominent corner speakers of that uh, Bang & Olufsen sound system we just mentioned. Uh, there's an armrest with cup holders right here, and you get seat back pockets and small shallow door bins. Plus, there's not only a 12 volt port, but there's also a 230 volt AC socket near to the twin vents, and this little reset cubby. And little touches like the double stitch door cards add a premium feel. Now, to some extent, the reason why it's so spacious back there is that surprisingly, Ford has opted not to add in a third fold-out seating row in the boot. Now, this seems curious given the success currently being enjoyed in this segment by seven-seat models like Land Rover's Discovery Sport, uh, and the lack of this feature, even as an option, does seem particularly strange uh, when you consider that the Edge was originally designed to include it. Uh, models sold in China, for example, do indeed offer the option to to seat seven. The Ford retorts that a D-segment crossover like Toyota's RAV4 sells very well without seven seats, but that SUV isn't big enough to take three seating rows. This one is. Where the five seat only approach should pay off though is when it comes to boot space. So let's have a look at that. Now, as you expect for this kind of money, you get a power operated tailgate that can be activated merely by waving your foot beneath the bumper if you happen to be uh, approaching the car laden down with shopping bags. Once the hatch is raised, there's a quite enormous boot. Uh, even if you only fill the space up to the window line, there's room for 602 litres of cargo. Pack it to the roof and you could fit in 800 litres of luggage. A pram and a couple of big suitcases would go in easily. Uh, this thick branded mat for the base of the cargo bay gives an upmarket feel, but it does rather get in the way when you're trying to raise the boot floor, uh, beneath which are various little compartments and the standard 18 inch space saver a spare wheel that Ford doesn't forget to supply. Now, unfortunately, uh, there is no provision to store the tonneau cover down here when that's not in use. As for the main boot area, well, this narrow recessed area on the left is pretty useless, but uh, you might well use this narrow bin on the right for small items. There are the usual tie down points for the provided boot net. Uh, you get a 12 volt socket and there are bag hooks on both cargo bay sidewalls. 
Ford has forgotten to provide for the carriage of longer items when the rear seat's in use, so there's no ski hatch or 40-20-40 split fold arrangement for the backrest. Uh, the divided rear seats are therefore split conventionally 60-40, and when you use these release buttons just inside the tailgate, they tumble forward with little effort. It's the same mechanism you'll find on the Ford Galaxy MPV, but unfortunately, unlike that car, the electric buttons can't also raise the seats back up, and the Springs that help flip the seats forward work against you when they're trying to push the things back up. Um, when the seats are retracted, they don't sit quite flat either. Uh, when the backrests are folded, a lengthy carriage area is revealed that's up to 1,688 litres in size. That's about 200 litres more space than you get in, say, a CRV or a RAV4, and it's more than enough for most likely owners. Ford hasn't helped this Edge model's prospects with the way it's priced the thing. Back in 2016, a price ban in the 30 to 40,000 pound bracket was quite hard to justify. So when in late 2018, the company decided that this revised version would start at 37,000 pounds and top out with this flagship Vignale variant at over 46,000 pounds, this SUV's fate was probably sealed. All models feature the same eight-speed automatic gearbox that Ford introduced as part of the update package. Now that uh, base price we just mentioned was for the entry-level titanium model that only 10% of Edge customers consider, that variant being the only one in the lineup to feature front-wheel drive and the lesser 150 PS version of the 2.0-litre diesel engine. Around 80% of Edge sales are based around the more dynamic-looking mid-range ST-line version, and that costs around £43,000, and it gets the more powerful 238 PS version of the 2.0-litre diesel mated to all-wheel drive. And that same premium power train uh, features with this ambitiously priced top Vignale derivative and that accounts for the final 10% part of the sales mix. On to the value proposition those figures represent, and that'll be considerably improved if, as is very likely, uh, you find your Ford dealer more than willing to sharpen up the list pricing we've just walked you through. Uh, now, the original pitching of those figures reflected the blue oval maker's hope that potential edge buyers would rate this car alongside comparably priced premium brand SUV contenders like Audi's Q5, BMW X3, and the Mercedes GLC. OK, Ford, of course, always knew that it didn't have the badge status of cars like those, but it reasoned that this Edge model's extra equipment and greater interior space would make up for that. Now, as we suggested when we first tested this car back in 2016, that wasn't a very realistic perspective. I mean, this model simply doesn't have the kind of premium cabin quality and agile handling that would be needed to take on Teutonic competitors in the SUV D segment. Uh, we ought to define for you what the SUV D segment actually is. Now, basically, it's the crossovers that are larger than Qashqai shaped mid size models, uh, but smaller than large luxury SUVs like, say, BMW X5 or the Land Rover Discovery. Plenty of volume branded manufacturers have some success selling SUVs into this D sector, but most of their offerings feature seven seats, which unfortunately you can't have on an edge unless you happen to live in China. So this Ford is prevented from appealing to the kind of buyer who might well be considering upscale versions of models like Land Rover's Discovery Sport, Hyundai Santa Fe, uh, Kia's Sorento, Skoda's Kodiak, uh, Seat's Taraco, all the Volkswagen Volkswagen Tiguan all space. A far more natural and similarly sized competitor to hobble by the same problem is Renault's Coleos, but that car's priced around £10,000 below this edge. Someone who'd buy a top specs Toyota RAV4, Mazda CX-5 or five-seat Honda CRV is probably closer to the kind of person Ford's aiming at here. But even then, the pricing's well short of what the Blue Oval brand wants to charge you for this car. Now, to be fair, the Edge is a slightly bigger product than the three contenders I just mentioned. Uh, it's sized rather closer to something like, well, say, a Volkswagen Touareg or a Jeep Grand Cherokee. Now, for reference, uh, both of those cars start at around £50,000, and that's about the cost of an Edge Vignale with a few extras added, a car, in fact, like the one we have here. 
So the Edge in all its forms faces a difficult task in the showroom, but its prospects are certainly helped by the generous levels of standard equipment that all variants feature. So let's take a look at that now. Now as part of the 2018 year changes, base ZTEC trim was deleted. So this revised Edge models lineup that kicks off now with plush titanium trim. That includes an awful lot. Uh, by that we mean full LED headlamps, 19 inch luster nickel alloy wheels, LED tail lamps, power folding mirrors, rear privacy glass, a quick clear heated windscreen, a hands-free powered tailgate, LED front fog lamps, acoustic side glass, uh, keyless entry, roof rails, all-round parking sensors, auto headlamps and wipers, uh, a rear spoiler, a mini spare wheel and a Thatcham Cattery One alarm. I told you there was an awful lot and we haven't even got to the interior stuff yet. Inside, titanium trim gets you leather upholstery, heated and cooled front seats, heated rear seats, uh, illuminated door scuff plates, ambient lighting, dual zone electronic automatic temperature control, a uh, configurable digital instrument cluster, and a 10-way electrically powered driver's seat with a memory function. Um, entertainment, that's taken care of by an eight inch color center touchscreen, which operates Ford Sync 3 media system. Now that incorporates a nine speaker DS AB audio package and a navigation setup too. Driving features include an auto high low beam feature for the uh, headlamps, uh, a rear view camera and also a series of camera driven safety features that we'll get to in a few minutes. Plus uh, you get adaptive cruise control which for uh, some reason actually costs extra on the plusher models. And now we also like the included uh, Ford My Key system. Now that enables you to program various parameters into a spare key so if you loan the car out say to your son or daughter you can restrict the speed at which they drive and even the stereo volume they choose. Uh, my key can also disable the car altogether if driver and passengers are not using safety belts and it can also prevent the driver from deactivating safety technologies like stability control. Now you wouldn't have thought that a comprehensive kit list of that sort would leave too much scope for extra features to be fitted further up the range, but you'd be wrong there. Uh, Ford designers say that looks are the primary motivator for buyers in this segment, uh, hence the mid-range ST line variant's relative popularity in the lineup. It looks sharper than a titanium variant, and that's thanks to the addition of larger 20-inch ST line black alloy wheels and sports body styling for the front, rear and side set sections, complete with subtle black detailing. There's also sport suspension and a more dynamic feel inside, thanks to the dark headliner, alloy pedals, ST-line scuff plates, and Dynamica seat trimming inserts. With an ST-line model, you're also treated to a thumping 12-speaker, 1,000-watt B&O premium audio system, and upgraded media connectivity, courtesy of the clever Ford Pass Connect embedded modem. Now that gives you onboard Wi-Fi, and live traffic information. And finally, there's this Vignale flagship model. It's set apart, Ford hopes, by its unique polished 20-inch wheels, its bespoke hexagonal upper grille design, and its more sophisticated matrix LED headlamps, which adapt themselves to road, light, and traffic conditions. The hexagonal theme continues inside in the design of the quilted Windsor leather upholstery, which includes special tuxedo-style stitching, and that also features on the door cards, uh, plus the leather extends to the center armrest, the storage console, and the instrument panel. Metallic paint is standard at this level, but for reasons that Ford couldn't explain to us, you have to pay extra on a Vignale for a couple of features which are standard on the other two lesser variants, uh, namely the heated uh, steering wheel and the heated and cooled front seats. On to options available across the Edge lineup. Uh, the key extra cost feature you'll pay more for right across the range is the panoramic glass roof. Although bear in mind that if you go for that, you'll have to lose the standard roof rails. Otherwise, uh, which extras you'll be offered will depend on the spec level you've chosen. On the base titanium model, you might well want the larger 20 inch wheels. And if you also pay extra for the top high performance B&O sound system, you'll additionally be able to order a front wide view camera uh, that camera is an included part of the driver's assistance pack that you can order for ST-Line and Vignale models. And that also includes 
BLIS, that's blind spot monitoring, active park assist to steer in spaces, and a more sophisticated version of adaptive cruise control, which is complete with lane centering and functionality that can bring you to a complete stop and then start you off again if you come across a tailback. Uh, now, with the ST line driver's assistance pack, you'll get the more sophisticated matrix LED headlamps too. Active park assist, uh, that can be ordered separately. And on the ST line variants, you can add in an active front steering system too. What else? Uh, well, as we said, the heated and cooled front seats of the titanium cost more further up the range. And as I mentioned previously, Ford wants to charge Vignale buyers more for a heated steering wheel. Uh, practical optional touches include a reversible luggage compartment mat and a detachable tow bar, and that can pull a trailer of up to 2,200 kilos. Plus, on titanium and ST line models, you can add in protection packs with rubber floor mats and a boot liner. Roof crossbars, roof boxes and carriers for bikes and skis are also available, as is a load floor net. And you could add climb air wind deflectors, which fit around the front window frames to reduce wind noise and turbulence when the door glass is open. Now, if you go for an edge with titanium or ST-line trim, unless you order your car with the only standard body color, that's Oxford white, you'll have to pay Ford more for one of the available premium or exclusive metallic body colors. Unfortunately, the brightest of the edge range's uh, original colors, uh, Electric Spice, is no longer offered. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this Vignale variant comes with metallic paint as standard, but many buyers opt to pay more for a Vignale exclusive body color like the magnetic finish that we have here. On to safety equipment. Now, as before, the car features a lane keeping aid, which will alert you if you drift out of your lane on the highway, and a pre-collision assist system, which scans the road ahead uh, as you drive, looking for potential collision hazards at speeds of up to 50 miles an hour. If one's detected, you'll be warned. Uh, if you don't respond, or, well, perhaps you aren't able to, then the brakes will automatically be applied to decrease the severity of any resulting accident. Uh, there's also a traffic sign recognition Ignition feature, which pictures road signs as you pass and displays them on the dash. Uh, this works in concert with the intelligent speed limiter system, so you can avoid accidentally going over the limit on any given road. As you'd expect, the Edge comes as standard with twin front side and curtain airbags, plus Isofix charge seat mounts, a tyre pressure monitoring system, hill start assist to stop you from drifting backwards on uphill junctions, and all the usual basic electronic assistance features. Um, these include ESC stability control of course, and anti-lock brakes with emergency brake assist, and an electronic brake pre-fill feature, and that shortens the time between pressing the pedal and the anchors coming on to further reduce stopping distances. And now there's also a driver alert system that warns you if your reaction suggests that you're getting tired. Uh, the main safety option is that driver's assistance pack we mentioned earlier with its BLIS, blind spot monitoring system, which on the move stops you from dangerously pulling out to overtake when there's a car in your blind spot. As part of this technology, you also get a cross traffic alert feature, which warns you of oncoming traffic if you're reversing out of a parking space. And now there's also an evasive steering assist feature, which uses a radar and a camera to detect slower moving and stationary vehicles ahead. Now, if the system thinks that you may be about to hit one, it'll provide extra steering support to enable you to more easily maneuver around that vehicle should a possible collision be imminent. You don't buy a large luxury SUV weighing over 2.1 tonnes and expect to get an exemplary set of running cost returns, but actually the Edge doesn't do too badly by class standards. Uh, this 238 PS bi-turbo model manages a WLTP rated return of up to 41.5 MPG on the combined cycle and 176 grams per kilometre of NEDC rated CO2. 
Another reason not to choose the 150 PS two-wheel drive version of this model is that it improves very little on those readings in terms of fuel consumption anyway, which is rated at 42.2 mpg. The base version CO2 reading is 153 grams per kilometer. It all means that if you fill the relatively large 66 litre fuel tank to the brim, you should be able to manage around 700 miles between fill-ups. That's provided you drive with a modicum of restraint. Uh, the fuel and CO2 figures we've quoted will mean very little without some sort of class perspective. So uh, let's tell you that a similarly sized, comparably powerful Mercedes GLC 300D manages 39.2 mpg and 157 grams per kilometer of CO2. Ford, in other words, has managed with this revised model to make the edges running cost stats a good deal more competitive. Uh, now we've touched on some of the reasons why elsewhere in this film. Uh, the two litre diesel engines improved Eco Blue technology certainly helps of course with its more advanced bi turbo charging system, uh, its more efficient fuel injection technology and its low friction architecture. So does the eight speed auto transmission which optimizes its gear shifting to suit your driving style and the surrounding environment. Plus, there's the improved intelligent all-wheel drive system that uses dozens of sensors around the car to rapidly determine every instance where additional grip just isn't needed. And when it isn't, the rear axle is completely decoupled to save fuel. That's a feature which, uh, just on its own, Ford reckons cuts the CO2 reading by six grams per kilometer. Plenty of efficiency oriented technology was already fitted to the original version of this car and is of course carried over here. So there's smart regenerative charging which harvests energy which would otherwise be lost under braking. Uh, the reasonably sleek shape and the carefully fashioned underbody aerodynamic shielding also play their part in reducing drag. And to combat harmful fumes, there's an active thermal management system which improves warm-up time so the engines reach peak efficiency faster. Plus, as you expect, there's the usual auto start-stop system uh, that cuts the engine when you don't need it when you're stuck in traffic or waiting at the lights. Uh, the engine features a lean NOx exhaust trap after treatment system for cleaner emissions too. What else? Well, if you're thinking of this Edge as an alternative to a premium badged SUV, you might well be worried about residual values. Actually, these are slightly better than we'd feared they might be. They're held up to some extent by this car's relative rarity. Independent experts cap reckon that after the industry standard three year, 30,000 mile period of ownership, a Vignale spec Edge model like this one will still be worth £19,875. Now, obviously that's some way off the kind of retained value you get from a rival Teutonic model, but it's far from catastrophic. Service intervals arrive every year or every 18,000 miles, depending on which comes soonest. Uh, there's the option of a Ford Protect premium plan that over two or three years can cut the cost of scheduled garage visits. Maintenance bookings can be done online through the My Ford portal. Now, this is part of the Ford Blue service scheme that wraps up all the care and maintenance of your car into one bundle and includes a free 30 point e check of vital parts and highlights any work required with a red, amber, or green traffic light warning to rank items that need attention in order of importance. Uh, there's also the Ford service app that you can download to your phone for free. That lets you locate your nearest dealer and make a booking. Plus it has a couple of extra elements. It allows you to find petrol stations and it includes a park me feature that remembers where you left your edge so you won't have to go hunting for it say in a busy multi-story. Uh, you'll need to keep the diesel engines add blue reservoir topped up too. A read out and the instrument binnacle will brief you on that. As for the warranty, well, like all Fords, this one comes with a three year, 60,000 mile package that also includes one year of Europe wide breakdown assistance. Uh, Ford does also offer the chance to extend this cover to either four years and 80,000 miles or five years and 100,000 miles. As you expect, the standard package gives you an anti corrosion guarantee for 12 years. And let's finish by briefing you on insurance ratings. The Edge Titanium front driven model with 150. 50 PS is ranked at Group 26E. Uh, the mid-range ST line 238 PS all-wheel drive model is rated at Group 34E. And this top Vignale variant with the same top powertrain setup attracts a rating of Group 37E.
Sadly for Ford, the British market never really understood this Edge model's strongest selling point, the fact that it gives you the space and most of the opulence of a large Volkswagen Touareg-sized luxury segment SUV for the price of a smaller Volkswagen Tiguan-shaped mid-sized one. It's a pity that Ford couldn't have completed the proposition with a third row seating option for Europe, but even so, the right kind of buyer might still find much to like in this package, if it was correctly priced. Unfortunately, the Edge never was, which is why it'll be remembered alongside the old Mark II Explorer of 1995 as just another of Ford's aborted attempts to sell a big American market SUV over here. Still, if you can find one at the right kind of sticker figure, you might well appreciate this car's supremely spacious cabin and enormous boot and be forgiving when you realize that it's less wieldy and rewarding to drive than other segment contenders at this price point. Sweetening the proposition is the fact that this SUV is superbly well equipped, although it is strange to find the base trim model including features that cost extra at the top of the range. Ultimately though, this is the kind of crossover that Ford used to make. Today, the company's SUV range, Echo Sport, Puma and third generation Cougar looks trimmer and better targeted with lighter weight and electrified technology. If though you just want luxury, gadgets, comfortable space for five and the price is right, we can see why there might be room in your driveway for an edge. With this revised model, Ford tinkered with this car's showroom proposition, but not enough to save its sales prospects in our market. If your dealer can still find you one, you'll get yourself that most unusual of things, a really rare family Ford. You might like the thought of that. Not enough other people did.